looks like uh, I think now's about a good time to get started. So thanks everyone for being here tonight. Thank you for joining us for a conversation with Hugh Howard and Ali Fazer on Hugh's new book, Architects of an American Landscape, Henry Hobson Richardson, Frederick Law Olmsted, and the Reimagining of America's Public and Private Spaces. My name is Thelissi Station, and I am here with the Seminary Co-op Bookstores in Chicago. Our stores were founded in 1961, and in 2019, they became the first not-for-profit bookstores whose mission is bookselling. That mission recognizes bookstores as fundamental civic institutions, and it allows us to work with like-minded partners on events like this one. Tonight, we are delighted to be partnering with the Department of Chicago Studies at the University of Chicago. Let me now go ahead and introduce our author and interlocutor. Hugh Howard is the author of numerous books on architecture and design, including Architecture's Odd Couple, Dr. Kimball and Mr. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, Architect, Houses of the Founding Fathers, and a memoir, House Dreams. He lives in New Hampshire, where the snow is lovely. And our interlocutor tonight will be Ali Fazer. Ali Fazer is currently a Harper Schmidt Fellow and Collegiate Assistant Professor in the Social Sciences Department at the University of Chicago. She is a cultural anthropologist trained at Bard College and the University of Chicago. Her work is situated at the intersection of visual studies, science studies, queer and feminist theory, and the anthropology of late industrialism. Her book manuscript, Photochemical Life in the Imaging Capital of the World, is an ethnography of American visual culture, industrial capitalism, and political fantasy through a material history of Kodak film. She's also collaborating with artist Jason Lazarus on a series of installations based on her research. We are so very happy to have you all with us virtually this evening. And if I can make one final note about format, there will be time for audience questions towards the end of the program. Please make use of the Q&A function, which you will find at the lower part of your screen to submit questions. And with that, I'll turn things over to Hugh and Ali. Great, I think uh, I think I go first. Uh, good evening. Uh, my thanks to uh, the Lazy and to Tess Conway for the invitation, to Joe for making the tech work, and of course to Allie for her thoughts and good questions to come. Um, and as, uh, as you were promised, uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of a reading, um, the two short excerpts um, from the book that are uh, lightly edited, um, so they make sense uh, standing on their own. High in the Rocky Mountains in January, 1887, a locomotive chugged up a steady grade, coal smoke billowing from its stack. To the surprise of the passengers, the brakeman brought the train to an unscheduled stop amid a tumble down array of workers' shanties. Once a busy place with a general store, two hotels, saloons, and even a school, Sherman Station, Wyoming was becoming a ghost town. A precisely dressed gentleman exited the Pullman car, his gait uneven, the result of a carriage accident long before, 65-year-old Frederick Law Olmsted, a man widely known as America's first and finest park maker, headed up a hill. Let's go to the next slide. His destination was a granite pyramid, constructed several years earlier to celebrate the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, an achievement that in the eyes of one journalist was the greatest triumph of modern civilization, of all civilization, civilization indeed. And certainly the transcontinental line, together with the matrix of roughly 10,000 miles of rails imposed on the 38 states in the preceding decades, now bound a once rural nation together into an increasingly urban and suburban place. Olmsted wanted to see that monument, as he, as he described it as our monument, uh, because it was the work of architect Henry Hobson Richardson who had benefited from Olmsted's critiques of early drawings. Olmsted approved of what he saw before him that day. I never saw a monument so well befitting its situation, he wrote a few days later, later or a situation so well befitting the special character of a particular monument. Yet the sight was accompanied by sadness since Olmsted had been a pallbearer eight months before for the irrepressible and irreplaceable Richardson. The funeral service held at Trinity Church in Boston, his friend's best known work followed the big man's death at just 47 of kidney failure. Richardson had been a form 
giver. A tight, as tightly packed cities fanned out, he devised prototype suburban railroad stations, which Olmsted had landscaped. Thanks to them, the nation's early commuters had experienced a welcoming sense of escape from what Samuel Clemens called the dusty and deafening railroad rush. We have a slide here. The nation had no history of libraries open to all when Richardson had been hired to create a public library. The half dozen freestanding examples he left behind were being widely copied. When Andrew Carnegie launched his national program, he looked first to Richardson's libraries with their linked book alcoves and reading rooms. Let's go to the library slide. Richardson had designed a wide range of buildings for a country in which the agrarian was fading, replaced by an industrial culture of growing cities. He and Olmsted, independently and together, had offered fresh design solutions. On this windy mountaintop, Olmsted felt acutely the loss of his dear friend, whom he acknowledged as the greatest comfort and the most potent stimulus that had ever come into my artistic life. Olmsted himself would carry on, of course, creating major works like the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina, the Stanford University campus, and in Chicago, the 1893 Columbian Exhibition. His memory remains honored today in many cities where his parks still improve the quality of life. In contrast, the Wyoming Monument is rarely visited in the 21st century. After the rail bed was removed, Sherman vanished, leaving the stone pyramid largely forgotten in its high meadow. Posterity would treat Richardson much the same. As the nation's most admired architect in his last years, his design ideas became received wisdom in death, he became an architect's architect admired in the profession, known from architectural texts, but his broader public fame faded. The public may forget, but friends remember. On this particular January day in 1887, standing alone in the whistling wind beneath the towering western sky, the grieving Olmsted found his eyes half drowned as he shed tears of mourning. Today, people tend to nod knowingly when they hear the name Frederick Law Olmsted. He's been the subject of popular biographies. His legacy is remembered and honored in many cities. In contrast, the memory of Henry Hobson Richardson leaves most people uncertain. Almost no one seems to recall the two lived as neighbors in both New York and Massachusetts. Let's see the slide of Olmsted here. Or that they worked together as regular collaborators for 20 years often functioning as one another's creative alter ego. Together, they left an indelible imprint on buildings and parks, both public and private. As members of the intellectual vanguard, they witnessed the nation's artistic emergence during the post-Civil War years. With the writings of Mark Twain, Henry James, William Cullen Bryant, men they knew personally, the American voice changed. Richardson and Olmsted were present at the creation of new intellectual and academic disciplines, including horticulture in which their neighbor, Charles Sprague Sargent played an essential role and scientific history, a fact-based approach to the past advanced by the work of Richardson's dear friend, Henry Adams. Olmsted helped establish forestry as a professional practice in his great late in life project, Bill Moore. Both Richardson and Olmsted were engaged in advancing the treatment of mental illness at the psychiatric hospital they designed together in Buffalo, New York. Let's have a picture of Richardson here. They joined forces with American artists such as Frederick Edwin Church, whose canvases captured sublime landscapes. John Singer Sargent, who painted Olmsted's portrait and Augustus St. Gaudens, who after working on Richardson's Trinity Church emerged as a world-class sculptor. They advanced the work of photographers like Carlton Watkins using images never before seen clarity and detail to advance their projects. The dramatist personae of their lives included presidents, governors, and other powerful politicians with whom they dined and collaborated. Some of the places they created honored the life of the mind as reflected in that new notion, the public library, and in numerous college buildings and campuses. Richardson designed bridges for Olmsted parks, rustic seeming roadways. At town halls, rail stations, and estates, for the wealthy, they left their joint imprint. 
Above all else, Olmsted and Richardson heard a higher calling, building larger, dreaming larger, and always in a uniquely American vein. No one had a bigger impact on the development of the American landscape than Frederick Law Olmsted. His years were 1822 to 1903. He founded the discipline of landscape architecture. He laid the early groundwork for what we know as environmentalism. Henry Hobson Richardson, he was a little younger, born in 1838 and died in 1886, was the man universally recognized as the most influential architect of the era. He sought to create what he called a bold, rich, living architecture to which posterity may point with pride. We have a combo slide of the two men together here. The two men never established a professional partnership and in most ways they were unlike. Richardson looked like Falstaff at the end of his life. He weighed 350 pounds. Olmsted was slight and short. Somber and serious man of the mind Olmsted usually seemed preoccupied with big thoughts. Perhaps not while he's batting a dog, but more often. Richardson had a way of bursting into a room in a manner that everyone noticed, always passionate, in the moment, full of laughter, unafraid of tears. Olmsted was a Connecticut Yankee whose writing about the South had helped inspire abolitionists. Richardson grew up in New Orleans. Members of his family were slaveholders. An eye ailment prevented Olmsted from heading to Yale. He was a self-taught park maker. Richardson, on the other hand, graduated from Harvard then studied at arguably the best architecture school in the world at that time, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. Yet they had a deep bond that was akin to a brotherhood. When I was writing this book, my working title was The Boulder Builders. And together they evolved a fresh vision, one that more often than not employed rude stonework to meld their constructions to existing terrain. Together, they addressed the demands of an increasingly urban culture while catering to both democratic values and the American compulsion for pragmatic answers. As the nation came into its own, these two men of genius employed the gifts of nature and their innate passion for beauty to redefine the country's rapidly changing landscape. End of reading. Al. Wonderful. Um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, thank I just want to start out first of all by saying thank you so much for this opportunity to engage with your work, Hugh. Um, incredibly evocative and generative. And unfortunately, just in the span of you reading uh, those short excerpts, I have uh, five more questions that I would love for us to get to, <laughs> which we won't. Um, but I think we can have a really fruitful and expansive conversation um, I do too. on what you've shared with us. Um, so my first question, which really um, is grounded so much in the passages that you just shared, is about friendship and collaboration. So you tell us in the postscript to the book that originally you had wanted to just write about Richardson because no one knew about him, but your publisher said, if you're gonna write a book about someone no one knows about, you need to throw in another figure as well. Um, and so I'm, and you've also written other books that are uh, biographies of collaborators. Um, and so I'm very curious about this in a couple of different directions. One, I am intrigued by how this expands the genre of biography. So rather than uh, simply telling a single narrative about a heroic individual, we're thinking here about friendship and about how the relationship between Olmsted and Richardson shaped their projects and shaped their thinking. Um, and so I guess that's one question for you, for us to think about together is just biography itself and how uh, centering two figures challenges and expands that form. I'm also really curious. Um, I'd why, love to why, hear don't I, why don't I take that on and then you can oh, yeah. follow up from there. Great. Um, you know, the, there are some very practical aspects to this, uh, to, to doing two people at once. Um, one being that, you don't have to lose yourself in the minutia of an individual life. Um, and, and of course, these days, people don't tend to write the kind of five volume biographies that one would have written of Thomas Jefferson or Madison or somebody a few years ago. Uh, it, it allows you to take the high points and when the going gets a little slow to jump to the other guy. Uh, 
So there are some, you know, just from a writing standpoint, there are really some significant narrative adva advantages. Um, it, with the two threads to follow, that obviously adds to the narrative and it makes the palette a little bit richer, um, not least because of the friendship. And in this particular case, um, as is the case with, uh, uh, to some degree, a previous book I wrote about Frank Lloyd Wright and Philip Johnson, there's, there's a tension, there's a kind of creative energy that comes from these people. And particularly in this case, they were very complementary interests that they had. Um, and finally, I guess I'd say that uh, having two figures allows you in some sense to triangulate in time so that uh, you're not getting one perspective, but maybe you can portray a little bit better the sweep of history because of the dual perspectives. That's my thinking anyway. Yeah, that, so that actually leads to the next point that I wanted to ask about, um, which is, I am curious as to how putting Richardson and Olmsted's stories together, you're allowed to make broader claims about American culture at the tail end of the 19th century. Um, and so, yeah, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about how putting, yeah, about how putting their stories together um, shapes the narrative argument that flows through the book. Uh, well, at the most superficial level, um, they did different things. Um, you know, one was a landscape guy um, and the other one was a building guy. Uh, but I think the, one of the singular virtues of, of, of their, of the work that they did together is that they were able to plant buildings in the landscape. Richardson was able to plant buildings in the landscape better because uh, if you will, uh, Olmsted prepared the soil. I mean, maybe that's not the best metaphor, but uh, I, I think that one of the, in the next generation, I mentioned Wright a minute ago, um, when Wright uh, became justly famous for building these indoor outdoor spaces where you move from the interior of the house to the outside, and it's uh, and it's a very easy transition. Um, I think that's a direct consequence of some of the work that Olmsted and Richardson did together, where uh, Richardson designed a house in, in more than a few occasions, uh, literally handed over a plan to Olmsted, who then sort of figured out a way to integrate the house into the terrain, and and it shows. Um, I think it's uh, you know spectacularly effective at uh, a number of their combined uh, uh, projects. I was struck throughout the text by a sort of refrain um, in describing Richardson's buildings about how they were, uh, yeah, as you're saying, situated in the, land, in the landscape. Yes. Um, and I'm just I'm thinking about vines, right, planted to grow on the facade of a building uh, or the immediate plantings right around there. Um, I'm wondering if you might have any more to say about, um, so both of these uh, artists were interested in site specificity, right? Um, working with the granite uh, that was at, at this particular site or following the undulations of the land on a particular right. lot. Um, and I'm wondering, um, I don't know if you could say anything about how they influenced each other in that regard, or if you see that as sort of a mutual project that they were advancing. Yeah, interesting. Um, the, you know, they did a, a number of projects where uh, uh, it, it needed to fit, uh, uh, maybe, maybe the best example of this, I wish we had a slide, but we don't, is a place called the Gatehouse, uh, where they literally use boulders and stones from the property. Um, Richardson did a preliminary design and polished that design, but when it actually got to constructing the house, uh, Richardson and also for that matter, had to visit the site in order to instruct the builders how to use the stones because the stones weren't these just plain Jane, absolutely uniform fixed. They weren't two by four by six. They were rounded and random and some of the biggest ones were on the bottom of, and it required the building to be adjusted to that. And I think that the reason that that book appears in every architectural text that I've ever, American architectural text I've ever seen is that it has that, uh, um, you know, I belong here quality. Um, which is very dramatic. Yeah, absolutely. I want to, and I, um, I'm hoping to get back around to the I belong here quality um, towards the end of our conversation. Um, but to shift for the moment, so um, as I said in the introduction, my research is on the history of photography 
So it was impossible for me to read this book without thinking of the influence of photography and visual sure. culture and imaging technologies. And I can see so many different registers on which they play into the text. Um, I am, I mean, for instance, um, in your discussion of Olmsted's time in California, Yosemite, uh, you speak there about sort of nature photography and photography of the US West. Um, so I'd be curious about how that influenced Olmsted's designs or how it influenced his thinking about the disappearance of the natural world. Um, you talk about um, I'm also curious, oh sorry, I'm also curious about the role of photography in popularizing Olmsted's and Richardson's work um, because they have such an outsized influence on architectural and landscape design in the following decades, century. Um, I'm wondering about how postcards, carte de visites, other images of their parks and buildings circulated and augmented their popularity in their time. Um, I'm also curious about the use of imaging technology and architecture and drafting and how transformations in those technologies might have enabled some of the moves that Richardson was making. Right. And I know I'm, this is also always a lot. Um, but a I'm, lot also, also, one more note, um, and we can bounce around through these. Um, I'm so curious about the influence of photography on Richardson's work, because so many of his influences, I mean, of course, he, um, he studied in France, he spent time in Europe, but so many of the influences in his architecture uh, come from Europe, Southern Europe, Southern France, Islamic Spain. Um, there's the pyramid that you showed us just now. Um, I'm thinking of, of structures I've seen in Syria, right? That resemble some of the fortresses that Richardson is using in his designs. Um, and you mentioned at one point in the text, um, yeah, Richardson is planning a trip to Europe and he is going to go see buildings that he'd only seen in photographs before. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. these are this sort of a, a compendium of the different ways I saw photography fitting right. into the text. Um, so yeah, any, um, any comments you have about all that? Yeah. that? Um, I'm, I'm gonna give you a kind of uh, random response uh, uh, to, the, to the, the several questions you've just asked. Um, I think, the nature photography aspect, as far as Olmsted was concerned, I think he used the Carlton Watkins photographs. Um, he bought a couple of portfolios of them. He sent them back east to his friend Calvert Vox, with whom he had designed uh, Central Park, and the set to his father, who was a powerful influence in his life. And I think the value of those, were, it, it opened people's eyes to a place that no one had seen. You know, at, at the time that Olmsted visited Yosemite uh, um, at, during the Civil War, 1864, 1865. Fewer than a thousand Europeans had been to, I mean, obviously Native Americans had known the place. It was a sacred place and had been for them for a millennia or more. But for Europeans, it was this incredible, stunning place. And it was those photographs of Watkins that enabled, uh, enabled uh, Olmsted to not only uh, alert his friends and family at home, but I think a set of those photographs ended up on Lincoln's desk at the time they decided to take Yosemite seriously and, and began the process of turning it into a park. So I think uh, those wonderful photographs really kind of opened people's eyes. That was the great strength of those. Um, Can later I... on, oh, sorry. when we go to Richardson and his photography, uh, he used them in a very different way. Uh, first of all, it was a little further along in time, a little further along technologically speaking. So unlike Watkins who you know, had to go to the dark room and print his photographs, uh, or th they were all made by a photographic process, by the time Richardson was, public, was producing his mature work, there were magazines that were out there, there were newspapers or publications called American Architect, American Architect and Building News, something called Architectural Sketchbook. Uh, in the earliest days of those publications, they had cuts made from drawings or photographs. But by the end of it, this, the, the processes had become sophisticated enough that he was able to use photomechanical reproductions. That, so they were actually photographs, heliotypes, photolithographs that were stunning. And they were tools, they were marketing tools for Richardson. He could let the world know, I built this wonderful church. 
and just look at this picture. If you can't come to Boston and look at it, you can look at it on this printed page. Um, so I think that was very valuable. Um, and of course, the, 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 the graphic aspect, um, the way Richardson worked was a little bit unique in that he, if he was asked to design a building, um, he would brainstorm, sometimes a matter of minutes or hours, and he would create a very small sketch, an esquisse, they called it at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which is just a very simple conceptual sketch which he literally in his mature years, because he didn't do a lot of his drafting at that point, he was not a fantastically gifted draftsman. He could draw, but he had other people do it for him. He would leave a sketch on the desk of a draftsman when he went to bed at night. And he would come back in the morning and the draftsman would say, okay, what do you want me to do with this? And then he would begin to draw and Richardson would guide the drawing from there, which would then produce at some point from another draftsman, a very sophisticated presentation drawing because in those days, if you didn't have a finished building, you had, somehow you had to sell your work. So you would sell it by a wonderful drawing. And then, so the presentation drawing would go to the client, the client would ooh and ah and say, yes, I'd love to have that building. And then the architectural office would have to create drawings, working drawings in order that the craftsman would know where to put part B in relationship to part A. So, so there's a whole bunch of imagery here, a whole bunch of ways of conveying what a building is all of which I think uh, um, evolved in the course of Richardson's, even his very short career. That's super fascinating. And those comments you just made, I think in some ways refer back to the idea of collaboration, right? To think about how the process of designing a building is necessarily uh, involving draftsmen, involving the head architect, involving the client uh, and the negotiation of all these different roles there. Yes, absolutely. And, and of course, there was a drafting, drafting portion of Olmsted's work also. You know, they had to do drawings, uh, presentation drawings in some cases. Um, although interestingly, Olmsted, he sold his notions of parks um, as much in prose as he did in drawings. Um, he did very extensive reports which were uh, written in such a way that businessmen could understand them. Uh, uh, and, and they, they, they sort of pitched what the virtues of these parks were. Um, and then the, the working drawings, of course, were, were necessary in order to instruct the earth moving and you know, to, to, to get the parks actually, to transform the land from into what was often not very impressive land into the wonderful parks that we know today as Central Park, Prospect Park, Washington Park, and so on. Yeah, I, okay, so I wanna just, bounce back to a couple of things you said that I think are, are worth saying more about. Um, but yeah, your response to my question about Olmsted and photography in the US West, um, I feel like you were also speaking to the extent to which, well, back to the role that uh, Olmsted played in the inception of environmental thinking and conservation in the US and the role that photography played in that as well, um, which is quite interesting. Um, I'm also just, uh, I guess I'm struck as well by your comments about print culture, right? So I asked just specifically about photography, uh, but part of your response was, we don't just have images, we have whole journals dedicated to architecture and of course to, uh, to gardening and landscape design too at the time. Yes. Um, so those also would have been all points of dissemination. Yes, that, that, no, clearly, uh, uh, you know, to address the environmental thing, I think that uh, in, in many ways, Olmsted was really present at the creation of the, the whole park. You know, the national park system didn't come to exist for a good many years later, but he put on paper the basic tenets of what we should do because he above all cherished the scenic. He, he thought that uh, uh, exposure to nature was enriching. That's why he built parks. And odd as it may seem, a constructed park like Central Park, or pick any, well, any of his parks, and there were dozens, something like 100 of them in various parts of the country, um, they would not seem to have a lot of relationship to a completely unspoiled landscape like Yosemite. But his point was, if we expose people um, in the city who are living in very tight quarters, who, uh, who don't have the means to leave town to go and see the White Mountains or uh, whatever, um, they can go to a park and they can be exposed to that. And those parks were clearly inspired by uh, the natural world that he knew as a boy 
and uh, and the likes of Yosemite and, and Niagara Falls, which he also played a role in conservation. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm bouncing around a little bit out of the order that I had imagined, but I think that's you're taking us there now. Um, but yeah, I was I was looking I was looking through the book again this morning, um, and struck upon this line. I'm just thinking about what you just said now about um, Olmsted's. Well, first, your comment that Olmsted's proposals were as much in prose as they were in images, mm -hmm. um, which I think speaks to uh, Olmsted's understanding about the purpose, or I, I don't want to say the ideological purpose, but um, the what he wanted to change in the world by making these parks, right? So that making a, a space to breathe in, uh, a space for people to encounter nature in the sublime, yes. um, space of joy, spaces of pleasure. Um, I also find so interesting uh, throughout your text, uh, these descriptions. So I'm, I'm just, just to read a quick phrase. Uh, this is from page 327. Um, Olmsted is, I think they're just, they're making built work. That's what they're working on. Um, Olmsted, I'm just gonna read the line. Quote, Olmsted devised a three mile approach road that meandered through a naturalized landscape with quote incidents along the route, quote consistent with the sensation of passing through the remote depths of a natural forest, um, and yes, the word sensation of passing through that um, one is not passing through a natural a natural forest, but through a facsimile or a simulation of that natural forest. Um, and I, I guess I find that interesting, given uh, your comments about photography, um, because we could see Olmsted creating a sort of second nature um, in the landscape uh, as creating a sort of image, right? Akin to a photograph uh, mm -hmm. of his impressions of nature. Right. Uh, I think, I'm not sure that, uh, I think what he was trying to do above all was take um, what in the case of much of the forest at Biltmore, um, and certainly was the case with uh, the central wasteland that was Central Park, is transform um, kind of rough and ready terrain into something uh, permanent. Um, and by permanent, I don't mean fixed, um, but by permanent, I mean something that is going to evolve over time. Uh, you know, it's, it's extraordinary that, uh, for example, uh, Central Park is uh, essentially as it was 150 years ago plus, um, although trees grow in that time and, the, and everything, the, the plant matter in the park is very different than it was then. And yet his vision um, wasn't 10 years down the road, it wasn't one generation down the road, it was multiple generations down the road so that he could transform it into something uh, that, that was really permanent when nature is simply not permanent, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's impermanent. Uh, so I think that at Billmore, that was perhaps even more true because that was sort of wasteland forest where as he told his, uh, his patron, uh, you know, most of the good trees were gone. So they had to plant trees, they had to, uh, they had to create what, was, what became a natural place. Uh, that, I know that sounds paradoxical, but uh, I think if you go there today, it feels like God did it. Um, um, and in fact, you know, Olmsted liked to say that what he was delivering in his parks was a specimen of God's handiwork. Um, that wasn't that he thought he was particularly holy. I don't think he did. I think he was a very practical, uh, you know, modest man. But that is what he was doing. Um, yeah, I find, okay, so I'm so interested in the sort of long durée in Eastman, in, sorry, the long durée in Olmsted's thinking and in his landscapes. And I think it's a really powerful argument against sort of environmental declensionist arguments. So against the claim that people in the past did not understand the long-term effects of their actions, because Olmsted is clearly thinking uh, on the scale of, of multiple decades, even centuries, rather than the short term. Yeah, I, I you know I think there's uh, there's examples of how um, we the, the much of the Many of the things that were done in the 19th century, industrial-wise, and uh, um, extraction businesses and the construction of the railroad, 
were you know, fundamentally destructive to the landscape. Uh, but there were other people who really did see things uh, in, in a much longer term, um, Olmsted, the principal among them. And uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, that shows in, in, in these places that, 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 that he's made. Yeah, so I think the reason that we, uh, we got connected uh, for this event today is that I am an Olmsted, a big Olmsted fan and always have been. Um, and so as, I'll say, as we're talking, I'm picturing Washington Park right now. So just, just yes. a little bit west of the seminary co-op um, and imagining sort of the lagoons, the sort of wild edges uh, of the perimeter and the walkways. Um, and I think my, my personal obsession with Olmsted, um, and I'm definitely projecting onto your book right now because- <laughs> You're alive. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, I find him to be a very romantic figure, uh, even tragic in some ways. And I, the word nostalgia really comes to mind. Um, I mean, this also, in that uh, opening excerpt that you read, this comes across so clearly as well. You know, you're describing the, the trains that were built across this landscape, how this particular town has already become a ghost town. So Olmsted is living and working, Richardson as well, in this time of massive change. Um, and I'm just thinking about how the great grand sheep meadows in Washington Park or Central Park, uh, oh. as well as those wild forest scapes, Olmsted was designing those, as you, as you tell us, um, as those landscapes were disappearing in the US. So as the West was being settled, as rural landscapes were being transformed into cities and suburbs. Um, and so, you know, we can see in this sense, Olmsted's parks are attempts to salvage or to conserve a world that is disappearing um, in that moment. And the reason why I think of him as being something of a tragic or romantic figure um, is that he was intensely concerned with the loss of those landscapes. Mm -hmm. And simultaneously, I think we can, and it's important to read Olmsted himself as, um, I don't want to say agent, but as, um, as part of the history of settler colonialism in the US, as part of the history of uh, developing and capitalizing land. And as I say that, I'm thinking in particular um, about the chapter on Buffalo, um, which is where I'm from. So I read that, read that very closely. Um, but in that chapter, you describe Olmsted touring around the city, looking for a site for his park. And he, he's uh, shown this beautiful giant vista of land that is undeveloped, uh, it's the same parcel of land that was um, acquired by the Holland Land Company uh, after the Revolutionary War. And Olmsted tells the person he's with, this is your park here. Sorry. And in order to make this landscape into a park, we just need to take or subtract some of the trees, right? And so we take this, um, I'm going thinking back to your comment as well, that um, the natural for Olmsted was constructed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think in, in that sense, thinking about, um, the park in Buffalo, for instance, it's it's clear for me to understand Olmsted as participating in the settling and colonization of land. And at the same time, as we've been talking about, and there's so much more to say to this extent as well, um, Olmsted was a very important environmentalist thinker. And he had very he had ambitions to make the world and make cities better and more livable places for the people right. who were in them. Um, and well, so I think you do a great job capturing like that vast complexity. Yeah, and I'm hoping we could. Right. You know, I, you know in, in a sense, uh, uh, Olmsted was uh, Peter with his finger in the dike. Uh, you know, it was uh, in, in his lifetime, the American population increased eightfold. Um, when he was born, um, everyone lived within two miles of pretty much plain nature. You know, you, you could get to an unspoiled tract of land uh, within a 45 minute walk from pretty much anywhere in the United States. Uh, on the other hand, that obviously changed because all of a sudden cities were exploding. Uh, suburbs didn't exist when Olmsted was born. Uh, by the time he died, they did. And he and Richardson had built railroad stations to get people there in order to enhance that development. Uh, in his lifetime, because of the railroad, the American economy boomed. It went from growing at something like 1% a year to growing an average of three or four or 5% a year, which meant not only transportation, 
but wealth, which meant uh, people had much more money to spend, they could do more things. And some people got richer and richer, but in general, uh, you know, people got to be better off. So I think as all these things were happening, uh, the land was being um, uh, developed and, and in some cases despoiled, which was really the rationale for creating a park. Um, and Olmsted came to this, you know, almost backwards. You know, he was in his middle 30s, he'd been a writer, he'd done a variety of other things when he got the opportunity to apply for a job to be the superintendent of Central Park in New York. He applied, he got his friends to pitch his candidacy and he got the job. Then he designed the park with Calvert Blocks um, and they created this park. Um, but he got the job because he was kind of a manager, not because he was an artist. Um, and in fact, he was very cautious on the art side. You know, he said, I'm not as confident as I might be there which of course contrasting to my friend Richardson, who you know, was always an artist, always saw himself as doing things. But I think Olmsted was a practical guy who saw the stuff that was in front of him, made the best of it. Um, and at the same time, and this was maybe the most important epiphany, if you will, that came to me as I was writing this book, is that there are very, very few people in any time that can see 50 and 100 years ahead. And he was one of the great visionaries of the 19th century for all the reasons that we're talking about, for the, you know, the, the, the park part, for the environmentalism piece, uh, for understanding that nature, nature was important to human health. I mean, that was, that was not a notion that people thought of uh, 50 years before where they were living a hard scrabble existence and just figuring out how to put food on the table and survive and put shelter over their heads. The 19th century permitted people to do different kinds of things. And Olmsted was there to raise his hand and say, let's think carefully about some of the places we're doing this and how we're doing it. Um, I, have, I have a couple of thoughts coming off of that. But first, I just want to say I love a story about someone who finds their calling in their mid 30s. Um, <laughs> yeah. You don't have enough of no, those all. stories. Yeah. Um, no, he did. He absolutely did. He tried some other things. He was good at some other things. He wrote some very good travel books. He was somebody whose writings about uh, slavery in the South um, really helped fire up the abolitionist movement. Uh, but it was really only when he found parks that his heart began to be faster. When we get off of this call, I'm going to send you an article as well, Hugh, um, by a former professor in the anthropology department at Chicago, Nancy Munn. So she, she wrote a little bit about, well, she wrote a lot about uh, the implementation of the grid system in New York City. Um, so that with was Olmsted. Yeah, hey. when, well, exactly. So with Olmsted and while Olmsted was working and as well, she, she, she writes about the um, Prospect Park, right? And so, you know, Brooklyn at that point was large farms and summer homes that were being carved up into smaller plots of land, right? And so I'm just thinking about sort of the, the broader culture and political, cultural, political and material changes that were going on in Olmsted's life that allowed him, or clued him into these multiple temporalities, right? And allowed him to see simultaneously both tomorrow and 50 years into the future. And I'm just thinking about that time period um, and sort of rapid changes that were going on in cities and in the, the built environment of cities um, as highlighting for the people living in them, uh, these changes that were going on. Um, there is, uh, speaking of uh, uh, the grid, speaking of rectilinear corners, which again, Olmsted disliked, there is, uh, in your neck of the woods, uh, there's a place called Riverside that he designed, which was really one of the first planned suburbs. And he, as, as he laid that out, he said, there are going to be no square corners here. Huh. Everything yeah. is going to be curvilinear. Um, there's a, because curvilinear streets deliver all kinds of things, you know, there's a kind of passivity about it, there's a, um, there's an element of surprise when you go around a curve and something emerges that you couldn't see before. Um, and, and it's evident in much of his work, including Prospect Park. You know, yeah. you can walk across Prospect Park and you can see hundreds of vistas on a single walk, just yeah. walking from one end to the other because it curves and changes and he's installed forests and waters and miscellaneous paths. Um, you know, it, it really is, it's not like walking in Yosemite, but it's certainly not like walking down Fifth Avenue or Michigan Avenue or whatever. Um, I love, I love what you just, I mean, I just love this comment you made about, yeah, the uh, the curved roads in the suburbs mm -hmm. um, and how they, 
yeah, bring up this sort of element of surprise. We don't know what's around the way. And this aestheticization um, of ordinary everyday life and taking something as regular as driving to the grocery store or getting to work and turning it into a sort of magical, um, opening up a magical possibility for encountering that space, right? And surprise and chance. Right. Um, so I was hoping perhaps we could talk about the, uh, the Back Bay Fens as a continuation of this discussion of Olmstead. Oh no, am I frozen or is? I believe you who's frozen, let's get him. What is referred to as the Back Bay in Boston was literally a bay, which in the process of uh, multi-year landfill process um, was hmm. We're losing you, Hugh. Uh, it's, the, it's the hazards of a virtual event. I'm sure we'll be back soon though. We'll be back. Yeah. Um, well, I can talk, oh, there he is. <laughs> I'd love to know what the Back Bay Fens are. We're about to find out. Oh, I can't wait. Hugh's back, welcome. Professor Howard, you are still muted. The blessing it is to live in this okay. day and age. Am I, am we can I hear back? you. You're great. I have no idea what happened. I didn't touch anything, but here we are. Anyway, the Back Bay Fence uh, were, was, was a park uh, that was a combination of lagoon and raised lands, and, and there were some bridges, and there were some, you know, a methodology of hydrology where the, the tidal waters could only go so far, and there was a system of dealing with the wastewater from nearby rivers. Uh, which solved a, a, a serious pollution problem in the third quarter of the, of the 19th century. Interestingly, um, much more recently, a hurricane uh, arrived in Boston, Mount Ida, and flooded the first levels of a whole bunch of skyscrapers down at the waterfront in Boston. But the Back Bay Fens handled the floodwaters without any difficulty whatsoever. So here we have, you know, an old solution um, suggested by Frederick Law Olmsted back in the 1870s, uh, that maybe we should be thinking kind of seriously about using uh, in, in these modern times of raising waters, rising waters uh, around our cities. Uh, okay, I want to ask you 10 more questions about the Back Bay Fence. Uh, I just want to throw out if anyone in the audience has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat uh, and we will, we will bring them into the conversation. Um, so you can just, yeah, type them out there and I'll read them out. Um, yeah, I am, okay, so I am so intrigued. Again, I'm picturing Washington Park. I'm picturing the lagoons in Olmsted's parks um, and your discussion of the Back Bay Fens in that location, we can understand the ponds and the water features as having, um, a, an engineering purpose, so not just an aesthetic purpose, right? right. Uh, but they were part of a giant, uh, massive terraforming project in the back bays to fill in the wetlands in order to capitalize and, and, and develop that land. Um, and as you're saying here now, um, and I'll just make a quick little um, plea for the Calumet Quarter, which I think is, is being taught in the, in the spring. So the Calumet Quarter is a, a Chicago course, or, a sequence of Chicago courses, a quarter long program uh, where you learn all about the Calumet region and all about the ecology of Chicago. And I TA'd this class years ago and we, we talked quite a bit about, um, yeah, the wetlands in Chicago, right? And how similar to the Back Bay, it's similar to the Back Bay in Boston, uh, the wetlands and marshes along Lake Michigan, the sort of dunes and swales were all filled in and evened out. And this has caused massive problems today in terms of flooding and in opens up new risks with climate change. Um, so I love this idea, and it's more than just an idea, right? But the fact that um, these features that Olmsted brought into the parks a century ago now serve this essential function that transcended his intentions of them. Um, and also I think bring together um, the question of aesthetic intervention, right? And I mean aesthetic in a, in a in more than just things looking good, uh, but about having clean air, 
about having access to space, about sensory experience. Um, so the ponds and the reflecting pools all had an aesthetic purpose, uh, but they, at the time, enabled the development and use of this land and since then have also um, served to mitigate effects of environmental destruction. Um, so that's to me, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I mean, just to me, I think as well, this really um, fleshes out uh, sort of the multiple, uh, I don't know, the richness of Olmsted's influence, right, in, in landscape design um, and in terms of, um, I know, the ambivalence of, of the work that he was doing. Uh, yeah, well, I think he, you know, uh, again, uh, his his work is uh, an astonishing blend of uh, of the aesthetic and the practical. Um, you know, the fact that uh, uh, th that they have the same utility that they did then, and um, can be, you know, e examples for us to to follow. Uh, you know, they're talking in New Orleans about all of the destruction of the waterlands around the city and how. Uh, that has transformed the ecology of the place and made them much more exposed to storms. Um, if Olmsted were around, he would offer them suggestions about that, I think, and they would, they would be good suggestions. Um, and he also had the capacity to couch them, if you will, in, in park terms, which you know, uh, helped solve continuing problems of wastewater, of, uh, of tidal flow, um, not only in emergency situations, but on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and incorporated in that particular case in the Back Bay Fence, that's one of uh, many pieces of what is referred to as the Emerald Necklace, which is a large sequence of parks that uh, um, traverses uh, much of Boston and uh, its uh, internal suburbs. This really, for me, expands how we could think about parks as, as part of urban infrastructure, um, because they're, while parks are certainly there, um, to, for their aesthetic value, for, for the joy and for the pleasure. They're also a necessary part of the water infrastructure and the uh, management of the landscape right. in these places. Right. And, and I don't think you can underestimate the psychological value of them either. You know, yeah. people, being, people being exposed to, uh, you know, to beautiful natural spaces, um, it's health giving. I mean, it's not accidental that, uh, you know, Olmsted refer, would refer to parks as the lungs of the city. Um, I think that's a reference to, you know, the, not only the trees clean the air, but that uh, they make the city more habitable and make us healthier. Yeah, absolutely. So I see a question here, which I'm going to read out in one second. But first, I just have to say what you're saying now, Hugh, is reminding me so much of your description of the uh, psychiatric hospital in Buffalo. I, I feel like uh, that's a place where we really get a, a feeling for how Olmsted and Richardson were using design to try to shape uh, sort of mental well-being, right? And the, the psychic health yes. of the people within it. Well, there was a school of thought at that point, which was not entirely wrong, I don't believe, that people with uh, uh, mental problems um, could be cured if they were given uh, if they were taken out of the busyness of the city, if they were given proper foods, if they were given work to do, if they had a schedule to live. And so Richardson and Olmsted together created this hospital in Buffalo um, that provided all those factors. Um, there was a farmland where they harvested food for the hospital and yet at the same time, the, uh, the uh, patients um, worked in that farm and it gave them a reason to be and organize their lives. And something between two thirds and three quarters of the patients who were admitted to the hospital left, um, if not cured, then at least uh, uh, were succeeded in, uh, in functioning in society uh, thereafter. So um, there is something to be said for the normality of a quiet life, I think, which is what they were really trying to create on an institutional scale. Yes. No. Okay, so there is a question in the chat that I'm just dying to hear your response to. Okay. Um, so I'll just read this out loud. There seems to be a moral dimension to Olmsted's work. Yes, this is just what we're talking about right now. So yes, it's aesthetic, but it assumes that the beautiful equals the good. Uh, and then the question asker asks, what do we know about the spiritual grounding of these men? And to what extent did their spiritual uh, beliefs play into their understandings 
of their own work. Um, well, well, neither of them were um, regular churchgoers. Um, both of them were intimate friends with many people who were intimately involved with faith practices. So uh, I'm not sure that we would characterize them as unbelievers, uh, but I think they both had their, you know, in Richardson's case, um, all you have to do is walk into Trinity Church and there is a sense of the infinite in that building. I don't know how you want to put that in uh, theological language, but it's there. Um, I think by the same token, I think that Olmsted as a child fell in love with wonderful landscapes and spent his life trying to perpetuate them in every way he could. Um, and, you know, he intoned, you know, words like God um, from time to time. But again, it was not in a kind of organized religious way. It was much more, my mother would have referred to it as home Baptist. She was a home Baptist. She was someone who never went to church, but she believed um, and she found it in the woods and she found faith in, uh, in plants and her gardens and other things. And, and I think these guys were much more that than they were um, you know, part of a specific faith, set of faith practices. Yeah, so I, um, I know it was about time to wrap up here, but I'm, I you mentioned Trinity Church. Uh, and I also love Trinity Church. So I'm hoping, yeah, just in this past last couple of minutes, we could, we could speak about that. And I, I'm wondering what you'd think about this proposal. Oh, thank you. Um, so the color in there is what I find so mesmerizing. Um, but I'm wondering what you'd think about this proposal, Hugh. Um, I would argue, wager, we'll say wager, uh, that Olmsted and Richardson contributed to um, sort of the consolidation of secularism in the US. Um, this is certainly a church that we're seeing here, but this church was imagined as a space also for political discourse, for people coming together and, and, and meeting and talking and learning. Um, and I'm wondering if you could, the, I guess the flip side of the question about spiritual belief might be thinking about the emergence of secularism in the US. Yeah, uh, well, I think uh, Richardson, uh, I, I guess any, any architect is only as good as the people who give them jobs because you don't build buildings unless some people will you know, commission you to do so. Um, and in the case of Trinity Church, which is you know, his uh, uh, you know, best known work and a magnificent, it was, it was the first building constructed in the United States that Europeans, many of them came over to see because they thought it was as impressive as what they could see at home. And that, that was unheard of in uh, 19th century America. Um, so it's a magnificent building. I think we can stipulate to that. But the reason it exists is that a man named Phillips Brooks who was the rector there said, we need a wonderful church. And he told Richardson what he wanted. And among other things he wanted was uh, a set of balconies, galleries he called them, for the hoi polloi, for average people. Uh, because he felt that his job was to speak God's words to man. And, and he wanted to speak them to all sorts of people, not only those who could afford the, uh, the pew fees, because it, you didn't go to church for free at a big fancy church like that. You had to contribute a little something um, in order to have uh, have a pew with your name on it. Uh, but he wanted everybody to be able to go. Um, so there was a it was a very democratic notion that he had, despite being born a Brahmin, despite being uh, quite a wealthy man. And I think by the same token, although Olmsted really had very little to do with uh, uh, with Trinity Church. I mean, he acted as a pallbearer for his dear friend, um, but. He also saw parks as very definitely a democratic activity. Um, now, whether that contributed to secularism or not, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's there, but, uh, um, but I think that uh, um, it, it was that they did work for everybody or attempted to. Yeah, I guess my secularism comment is thinking about, um, thinking about uh, Phillips Brooks, the pastor at Trinity Church, right? And this is also, you know, this is a space for, for learning about politics and debating about politics um, as much as it was, or crop, maybe not as much as it was, but in addition to being a space for spiritual contemplation. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think this, this, um, this is a fantastic place to conclude, uh, thinking about the sort of democratic impetus behind both of, both of their work um, and the imagining of an architecture for the public. Um, 
and a space for people to come together. Um, Very much. Yeah. A fantastic conversation. Thank you so much, Ali, Hugh. Um, thank you so much to everyone at Chicago Studies for facilitating. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and drop a link where you can pick up your very own copy of Architects of American Landscape, uh, which I know I for sure wanna check out after this talk. Um, truly, truly astounding. Thank you all for your time. Oh, can I drop this link in the chat? I may not be able to. Oh. You can find it if you go to semcube.com um, and we highly encourage you to check out his work. Thank you all again for being here and have a great evening. Thank you Thanks so for much. Listening.